Perhaps no country in Southeast Asia has experienced as wild a swing in terms of its foreign policy and relations with great powers as the Philippines. Over the past decade alone, the Philippines went from one of America's closest allies in the region to one of China's closest partners in Southeast Asia. But things are beginning to change once again under another Filipino president. Ferdinand Marcos Jr. largely signaled policy continuity with Rodrigo Duterte when he was running for the presidency. In many ways, it made sense for him. He was part of the unit team with another Duterte, Sara Duterte, who was then running for the vice president under a single ticket with Marcos Jr. Throughout the presidential campaign, Marcos Jr. did not mention so much the importance of the Philippine-U.S. alliance, but just like Duterte emphasized the importance of diplomatic engagement. Now, to understand this wild shift in Philippine foreign policy, we have a very special guest today. He's someone who actually has served at the highest levels under both the Duterte administration and the Marcos administration. Ambassador Babe Romualdez served as Duterte's top envoy to the United States and is also in the same position under the Ferdinand Marcos Jr. administration. Perhaps there's no one better than him to better understand this radical shift in Philippine foreign policy. Or perhaps it's not as radical as we thought. Let's figure out what's really going on with Philippine foreign policy together with Ambassador Babe Romualdez. Ambassador, can you tell us a little bit about what was your understanding of what was happening under President Duterte, who by all accounts had a very, I would say, unorthodox approach uh, an understanding of the Philippine-U.S. alliance. And I would even say one thing that made President Duterte very uh, distinct was perhaps he also had a very unique understanding of where the world was going in the 21st century. I mean, my sense is sometimes he would almost say that we're in a post-American world, I mean, to borrow the term from Farid Zakaria, right? Um, I, I just felt he, he was, a, in a way, transformational leader, right? I mean, whether you agree with him or not, he, he represented a major juncture in Philippine foreign policy and, and political history? I think that, uh, you know, I always say uh, that any president, or any anybody for that matter, is a product of his time. Right. President Duterte was uh, president of the Republic of the Philippines, uh, uh, and he was a product of his time. The Filipino people voted him in uh, with 16 million votes, and obviously they wanted to see him uh, in terms of the way he handled our domestic politics, uh, he was very strong, obviously, in uh, in uh, criminality, especially right. in the drug war. But he also looked at the world in a different spectrum. He actually right. looked at it in a way that he felt that uh, reaching out to China, because the previous uh, administration then was kind of blocked out of China. Right. So he was uh, reaching out to China and telling them that this is this is a new administration. We'd like to reach out to you. We want to be your friend. And he also wanted to prove to the United States that uh, if you are a friend and an ally, then you have to work with us and uh, give us the same kind of respect that you give all countries. We are a sovereign state. I think that those messages were very right. clear, uh, which was reverberated in a way here in Washington, D.C. I think that uh, uh, many of the leadership here in Washington realized that. And as I always say, right. uh, Secretary Austin uh, rightly said, that we should never take our allies for, for granted. granted. Yep. And that, that I think, is the main, uh, I would say, the main um, success of what President Duterte conveyed to the United States. Right. That we are an ally, but you cannot take us for granted. Right. That we are mm -hmm. a sovereign state and that we are also looking out for our own national interests. Uh, Ambassador, the reason I'm pushing on this point is because, you know, upon reflection, um, the way I look at uh, President Duterte was he was not only tactical in terms of our alliance with the United States, but also very much had a different strategic vision for the Philippines and its place in the world. I mean, uh, my understanding was, you know, President Duterte was not just there to get more out of our alliance from the United States. He wanted to kind of uh, redraw the Philippines' position in the world as kind of a more autonomous, independent, strategic actor. Um, is that how you also understood him? What is your understanding of that issue? Well, uh, to a certain extent, uh, yes. But uh, also, the other part of it is that uh, it, it, it should never be a, a zero-sum game, so to speak. Right, uh, right. Our relationship with the United States obviously is an important one. And I'll never forget uh, 
what uh, then Senate President and now the Presidential Council, uh, Juan Ponce Enrile, told me before I took right. up this post in Washington. He says, we cannot un- afford to antagonize the United States. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So th- that, that, I think, is a, a very profound statement. Uh, it's very clear that we, we must uh, continue to have good relations with all countries, especially our major ally like the United States, while reaching out to China at the same time. And also trying to explain to them that we are a sovereign state. We would like to have a good relationship uh, with them uh, because not only are they our neighbors, but they're also a major country, a world power, economic and mm-hmm. military power today. So, again, it, it all plays out in one, 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 one thing. Our national interest is paramount in anything. And I think that, mm-hmm. that at the end of the day, all our leaders, including President Duterte, just thought, what was best for our country mm-hmm. during right. his time. Well, as you can see, uh, probably uh, uh, after being here in Washington for the past four and a half years, uh, you can see that my hair has receded quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, you can imagine the kind of pressure. <laughs> yeah, you can imagine. Uh, yeah, kidding yeah. aside, though, I, <laughs> uh, well, I, I'll tell you that it, it was challenging, but at the same time, I think, like I said, it was fulfilling in the way the that... Warning, yeah. uh, President Duterte had his has his own unique style of diplomacy, <laughs> and uh, the messages that he conveyed uh, again here in Washington D.C. was one of the challenges that I had was to tell our friends here that this is the, what he meant. You know, you you would try to interpret it in such a way that right. they, our friends would understand exactly where he was coming from. But like I said, his unique kind of uh, his brand of diplomacy had worked to a certain extent, which paved the way to where we are today mm-hmm. with our relationship, not only here in the United States, but in the global world and also with China. Right. I think that uh, President Marcos Jr. is now, uh, I would I would say that he's reaping the fruits of, of, of what happened during the far past four and a half or five years during the Duterte administration. Uh, Ambassador, going back to this, I mean, I, my, my understanding is perhaps also folks in Washington, D.C., you know, they had also a very colorful president themselves by this time, Donald Trump. So I think perhaps that made it easier for them to also understand uh, that, you know, that words, certain statements by President Duterte has to be put into context. And I think you were playing the same important role in interpreting that, operationalizing that in the same way that I understand, uh, you know, top American officials were, were doing back then. So perhaps there was some solidarity that, you know, we have presidents who may have in artful way of putting things, but the core strategic message is something that should be taken seriously and should be appreciated accordingly. Uh, perhaps that's that's the sense I get of that that era in terms of Philippine-U.S. relations. But Ambassador, what were the highlights of the Duterte era as far as your portfolio is concerned? Because obviously one of the things that President Duterte raised was our fraught history with America, something that no other Filipino president did in the past, or at least in the same manner, and that brought us the, to the Balangiga issue, right? And some of the atrocities mm-hmm. during the American occupation of the Philippines and the Philippine-American War or Revolution, right? Um, what was going on there, Ambassador? And can you tell us a little bit about also your role during that time? Because I know you played a very important role um, during that time. Well, you know, President Duterte, again, communicated to, uh, to not only to, to our people, but also to the United States, that uh, there were atrocities that were committed during the time of uh, the Philippine-American War and uh, in the eight, in the uh, early 1900s. And President Duterte is a, a well-read. Uh, right. He reads a lot and he knows a lot about history. And obviously, he, he pointed out the, the Balangiga Bells as mm-hmm. an example of what atrocities that were committed by the Americans during that war, where uh, 10-year-olds were even uh, actually killed yep. uh, by the American soldiers because of what happened to the Balangiga. Uh, we, we all know the history of that Balangiga bell. Those also the bells that were used to signal the attack that made that our Filipino revolutionaries did in, Against in the, the town occupiers. of Balangiga in yeah. summer. Yeah. And, uh, and I can tell you that... Uh, President Duterte was very passionate about this. Correct. Not only that, he was also extremely emotional. Right. I will never forget, uh, really, when when those bells were finally returned to the Philippines, and uh, those bells were brought to Samar, where we had a little bit of a ceremony there uh, with 
the U.S. Uh, charge of the affairs at that time, and um, and our uh, side. But uh, the ceremony was just part of it. President Duterte walked to the plaza, which was right across where we had that uh, ceremony, and he was touching the names of the, I think, the hundred plus that were actually killed. And I was watching mm. him very carefully. Mm. He was very emotional, and he had tears in his eyes. Right. I think to me that really, that really pointed out on how mm. President Duterte felt about his country mm -hmm. and the history and the atrocities that were committed. No one really knows uh, that particular part of that uh, right, event, right. but I saw it in person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was very fortunate that uh, I was able to take uh, a snapshot and a video, as a matter of fact. And in fact, one day I'll probably share it with everyone because right. it was really very moving, I think. And, and, and so Malangiga was a symbol that President Duterte used to point out that there has been that kind of history that also occurred. Obviously, it had something to do with the accusations that were being made that he was uh, a brutal uh, uh, ruler in, in the drug war. Mm -hmm. But he also was very passionate about that because he felt that the drugs were, and, and I think it's been proven so, that uh, drugs is actually uh, almost destroying our country. And President Duterte was able to, to sort of like he was not able to. He admitted it himself that he was not able to totally uh, annihilate the mm -hmm. uh, the drug uh, situation in our country. But he just brought it down to a level that at least to a certain extent is manageable. Mm -hmm. Because the worst thing that can happen to us if we become a uh, a uh, narco drug state, state. narco state, yeah, like other countries in Latin America, a narco state, yes. And so and and he was able to do that. The, th those are the things that we, we have to put mm -hmm. in the right context on, on, on the history of what happened during his time and where we are today in terms of uh, what our relationship is, what happened in the past. And we should never forget the past because obviously uh, it is part of our history and it is something that is very important for us to understand and to always remember. In fairness to the United States, mm -hmm. to the Americans for that matter, they're very good at, uh, at doing uh, healing the wound, so to speak. Uh, just the, the recent history. Right. We can talking about Japan. Japan and the United States are. It's probably a relationship that they have that is extremely. Uh, uh, it's 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 at its best. Our relationship with Japan is the same. Right. We we were at war with them in uh, in in Second in World, World War, War yeah. Two. Yeah. And uh, the United States of the Second World War. And then uh, also we have to remember what happened with Vietnam. Vietnam's relationship with the United States is, is, is it's at its best. As a matter of fact, right. uh, we have to uh, work on having that kind of relationship with the United States. Because Vietnam now is a major trading partner of the United States. And, and these are things that we have to talk about in the future on how we handle and our relationships today with countries like China and the United States. You see, Vietnam has been very strong with their territorial dispute with, uh, China. with uh, China. Yeah, they have been they have been very firm that what is ours is ours. That that is the policy that they've had. With the United States, they say we want to have a good relationship with you. Now, what's the difference between us and Vietnam? Vietnam today has double their trade with China, double with their trade the with the United States, yeah. double ours, yeah. and yet we reached out to China, and we reached uh, we we had a good relationship with uh, with uh, the United States. Now, there's something that we're lacking here. Right, something remains. And to yeah. me, I think it's very simple, uh, at least the way I, I look at it. Right. We have to be very firm with what is ours in terms right. of our relationship with China. And we have to make it clear. With the United States, we say that we are our, your friend, we are our, your partner, we are your uh, allies, major allies. But uh, we, we need to have more economic trade between our countries. Right. And, and, and that's the way 
I view uh, the way we should handle that. Uh, and, and I think that we're moving in that direction right mm -hmm. now with President Marcos Jr. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for giving context on those very important issues as far as mm -hmm. our bilateral relations are concerned. Now, obviously, one of the mm -hmm. sticking points under President Duterte back then was the threat to end alliance or in specifically when he unilaterally tried to abrogate the Visiting Forces Agreement. Can you give us a little bit of background about it? What was really going on there? Was, was that threat even serious? Was that part of some sort of a bargaining chip? What was really going on there? And because eventually President Duterte rescinded that decision. So I think a lot of people are still confused. What was that all about? Well, I think the objective of President Duterte, as I said, was to, to, to again, communicate to the United States that uh, uh, if we have a relationship with you, meaning mm -hmm. the United States, then the Visiting Forces Agreement, obviously, was it's supposed to be mutually good for both our countries. I think that there was a report uh, that was made that uh, every time they'd come uh, to the Philippines for a uh, for exercises, our soldiers would be able to practice on a certain type of uh, equipment. Right. But then uh, after that exercise, it just is brought back by the United States. It's not. In other words, we lend it to you for the exercises, but we get it back. Mm. Uh, that's probably a, a very shallow way of looking at it, but not really. I mean, the message is, let's work on modernizing our equipment so that our soldiers will train with you and be a real mutual partner. You know, mutual defense means we will defend you if you're attacked and you will defend us if we are attacked. But if we are using uh, handguns and you're using the large I see. Uh, artillery type of uh, equipment, and we don't have that, then we're not really a mutual partner. I think that, that, that that's this kind of way the message uh, uh, was brought about. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, uh, quite honestly, uh, it worked in a way because, again, uh, the United States understood that with President Austin. Uh, I'm sorry, with uh, Secretary Austin. He actually made sure that a lot more was done in terms of modernizing our armed forces. Uh, not only, you know, we, we were not asking for for, for free, uh, but we wanted to have certain things that would be, uh, we'd be able to purchase uh, mm -hmm. at reasonable prices. And, and, and uh, in fairness, we've had the largest amount of military assistance that was ever given to us in the last 10 years alone. It was somewhere between 600 to 700 million dollars mm -hmm. worth of, uh, of all sorts of uh, equipment and all kinds of training that we got uh, from the United States. And, and this is a continuing effort that, that we are now uh, in the process of modernizing our armed forces and making our soldiers more uh, trained better to be able to, uh, to adapt to the times. Right. This is, this is mm -hmm. really the offshoot of that uh, particular mm -hmm. uh, threat of the VFA uh, being one-sided. And then President Duterte looked at this mm -hmm. as if this is just for you and not for us. It has to be mutual, and, and, and rightly so. Uh, but what about, Ambassador, the angle that, well, this came not long after, uh, you know, some U.S. senators or legislators were, you know, threatening to kind of push for sanctions against the Philippines and, you know, the context of disagreement between at least some politicians in the United States and the Philippines over the human rights and democracy issues. Uh, to what degree was that influencing the whole VFA discussion? Because the timing kind of suggested that perhaps was the more trigger, right? Well, I, <laughs> there will always be that kind of threat. And, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that President Duterte was prepared to, to take it on. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to give it to President Duterte when he, uh, he, he made his decisions and he says that uh, we will survive. We have to prove that we are a nation that is sovereign and we have our own interests to protect. Mm -hmm. And that is the communication that I had uh, at least uh, at hand, and, and that is what I communicated to our friends in the U.S. Congress, that let's work out these issues on human rights and whatever it is that, uh, but let's, that, let's not push it to the situation where, where you, want, you are pushing us away mm -hmm. from you and, and, and therefore pushing us to another country that uh, is now a, a major uh, uh, competitor. Uh, we, we want to have a good relations with all countries.
countries. Mm-hmm. That that is that that is the meaning of a friend to all and an enemy to none. But we have to always be cognizant of what is best for us. Mm-hmm. And I think that President Duterte again uh, communicated that in his own unique way to our friends here in Washington. Uh, Ambassador, of course, uh, later on when. Uh uh, uh, Lloyd Austin visits Manila in 2021. We have President Duterte rescinding the decision of initially you know, threatening to abrogate the VFA. And one of the things that he cited was the vaccine donations from America. We're talking about millions of vaccines donated to the Philippines. I think it was one of the highest in the world, at mm-hmm. least second, I think, or almost at the same level as Indonesia, which is a very large country. Um, to what degree did America's, quote-unquote, vaccine diplomacy under the Biden administration help in you know bridging the gaps perhaps and setting the tone for a better bilateral relationship later on especially in 2021 what is your understanding because my understanding is that you also played a very important role during this period right in terms of making sure the filipino people get the best possible vaccines and that's american-made vaccine in, in a lot of cases well uh, i i i think that uh, clearly uh the pandemic was mm-hmm. something that uh it was something that all of us uh, will never forget. Uh, it happens uh, only once in every hundred years, and uh, we mm-hmm. all experienced it. And everyone, uh, of course, was not only concerned, but uh, it was in a very, a very emotional moment. And so when it was clear that the Biden administration wanted to, well, first and for- foremost, the Biden administration, when they, uh, when they took over in January of 2020, they... Made it, President Biden made it clear that he wanted the Americans to get vaccinated first, and so he did not allow any export of any vaccines until every American was able to receive the vaccine, mm-hmm. which is, of course, Understandable. Uh, natural. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, but we had already negotiated to to buy our own uh, supply uh, with the help of. Uh, with the uh, private sector led by uh, Mr. Enrique Rason, who I have my greatest admiration for because he really uh, was one of those that uh, stepped up and said that uh, I will do this uh, for our country and for our people. And so he gathered, he, he himself uh, mm-hmm. made a commitment even before our government uh, made a commitment because we have to go through a lot of processes. Right. And so he put up the money uh, to be able to, to, to buy these vaccines. And, and uh, I, I will always have a great admiration for people like him because uh, it, it, they may be big businessmen, but they also thought of our country mm-hmm. and our people. But anyway, uh, we had to ask the White House to allow us to have these vaccines. And that was the start of what I call uh, you, you may want to call it the vaccine diplomacy, mm-hmm. but we had to be very aggressive in our pushing for those vaccines to to come to the country. And uh, we have a lot of people. I had a lot of friends mm-hmm. who have actually uh, died because of the of the COVID. And it was very emotional even for me. But I also had a lot of friends and people who were telling me that when are we going to get those vaccines? Mm-hmm. And so um, I asked uh, President uh, Duterte, I asked uh, through uh, Secretary uh, Medeldea if I could have a, a Zoom meeting uh, with, with the president on, the, on a secured line. And we had that Zoom meeting with the president. And that is where I mm-hmm. was very clear with the president that uh, our relationship with the United States is 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 uh, is. is in, in, in a good uh, situation, mm-hmm. but at the same time, it was very important for us to really uh, look at the total picture, that, which included the visiting forces agreement. Right. And so I appealed to the president in a very emotional way, and I told him that, Mr. President, we, I, I think if we give the visiting forces agreement, which is very important for the United States, it will help us in facilitating the... Uh, the export of the vaccines from the United States to our country, and I and I and I very emotionally told him mm-hmm. in Tagalog. I said, "Maraming mamatay sa atin, Mr. President, kung hindi natin ipigay yan." Mm. And um, and I, President uh, Duterte understood that very clearly. And I think shortly after, uh, President Duterte had agreed that we will reinstate the uh, the visiting forces agreement, and so. Uh, 
we we got more than uh, what we bought. Uh, there was a lot of donations that came exactly. in, and, uh, yeah. and 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 so I think uh, our people, uh, many of them, uh, were very appreciative of of, of the uh, of the vaccines that came into our country, and has uh, brought us to where we are today. And and uh, again, uh, in fairness to the United States. Uh, they have not only been generous to us, but they have been generous to other countries as well, uh, in in terms of helping out in, in every way they can. That, that that is a mark of the American generosity, that they uh, have donated a lot of these vaccines that were developed here in the United States uh, to give to the world, and also for their own interest, of course, in the mm-hmm. end, because mm-hmm. obviously the pandemic is not uh, unique to just one country, but to the right. world for that matter. Now we're talking under new administration, Ferdinand Marcus Jr. So what are the circumstances of you staying as the ambassador to Washington, D.C.? Was, was the job that uh, enjoyable, that <laughs> you were okay to stay there? Because as you said earlier, it was really a taxing, taxing you know, portfolio, right? I mean, not an easy job. Well, it's, it's a challenging job. Uh, it <laughs> continues to be challenging. But one thing for sure is that... Uh, uh, like I said, uh, you know, Richard, at my age, uh, I, uh, you know, you you are at the point in your life when you want to do something for the country, right. and uh, and so uh, taking on the job uh, with President Duterte was challenging, but at the same time fulfilling because it was something that it was good, and I think we've been able to do uh, in our own way, in our own little way, in contributing to. To, uh, to our country and, and, and for our national interest and for the good of the country. And now in the case of President Marcos, needless to say, I'm more than willing to do so because mm-hmm. uh, not only is, is he a friend and, and a relative, right. but I really, have, uh, uh, I, I really have good vibes about him, mm-hmm. knowing him well enough that, that I know that he, his main motivation is to do good for the country. Uh, he is one person that uh, really does not really need this job, uh, but he wanted to do it because he felt that it was important for him to do it, not only on a personal basis, but it is something that mm-hmm. he wanted to do for, for the Philippines. Uh, we all love our country, mm-hmm. and we want to do something good for the country, and, and that's the only motivation we all have, and, and, and that's the best motivation that you can have. Yeah. In, in, in any way you can to be able to do good for the country. Yeah. Because yeah. just to remember one thing, Richard, and I want to remind everybody, including our, our Filipino-American uh, mm-hmm. friends here in, in the United States, remember you have only one real country, and that is the country that you were born, and that's the Philippines. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for that. I, I want to ask on this, to what degree do you think that President Marco Jr.'s approach or vision of... Philippines foreign policy was shaped by his own father because we talked about the Cold War period and now everyone's talking about a so-called new Cold War period. So there are some parallels mm-hmm. there, right? Uh, how do you think that that past or the legacy of his father or the playbook of his father for that matter has shaped his own approach to foreign relations? Because if you look at it rhetorically, at least President Marcos Jr. kind of speaks like his father, right? You know, we want to keep it strong mm-hmm. with the United States while we're trying to also build robust relations with other uh, poles of power like China, uh, among others. So, what's going on there? Is is, is there is is there kind of a learning from the father's legacy here? Well, of course. Uh, you know, anyone who who uh, who has uh, <laughs> uh, admiration for your father, and, and there's no no doubt that President Marcos Jr. Uh, really uh, admired his father and mm-hmm. for everything that he was able to do for the country and then so he learned from that uh, he learned from that and he learned also from whatever mistakes that were that happened in in the past and and, and that's why i personally think again that he will do well because he has that kind of uh, uh, so-called uh, uh, training and, mm-hmm. and the school that uh, he right. learned from uh, on especially on, on the geopolitical situation uh, all that will 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 uh, will give him the experience and the opportunity to be able to do good for the country and our national interest. That that's the key to anything. Mm-hmm. All of us, whatever experiences we have in life, is what's going to make us do what we're doing today. Ambassador, of course, this is where we really go to the 
perhaps what many find as the most in interesting development in bilateral relations, we're now talking <coughs> about the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement. What happened there? Because mm. during the campaign, I, I remember, I mean, I covered this as a journalist and as an academic. I mean, President Marcus Jr. back then as a candidate was not so much talking about the alliance. He was talking about the value of dialogue with China. And now we have here not only fully implementing in the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, but also expanding American access under EDCA to a number of very priced bases, one in Isabella, one in Cagayan, and of course, uh, you also have one in Palawan, among others. So these are, these are very important bases close to both Taiwan and the South China Sea. So doesn't that mean that the Philippines has more or less now aligned with the United States? Or no, maybe this is just part of just upgrading the alliance while still keeping our options open. What's going on here? Well, you know, it, uh, one thing for sure is that when you step into mm -hmm. the palace and become president of the Republic of the Philippines, your information is wider. Right. You have more, uh, you have a bigger picture on exactly where we are and right. what we need to do. And uh, President Marcos, obviously, uh, Jr., when he stepped into the palace, uh, was given the kind of briefing that, uh, that only presidents get. And you have a whole uh, view and you have information that's given to you not only by our own intelligence community, but intelligence mm. from other countries as mm -hmm, well. Mm -hmm. And when you have that total picture, you make your decisions accordingly. That, that, that is the difference between okay, if you think, are yeah. outside and you're looking right. in. This is, he is inside. He knows exactly where we are and our relationships with other countries and at the same time on what our security situation is. And I think the decision that he made is based exactly on what mm -hmm. intelligence information that he has received and that it was better for our country to be able to expand this relationship with the United States. Oh. I, that, that is the right. only reason why he did this. Again, it is because based on what he feels mm -hmm. is best for our country. Uh, Ambassador, I want to push on this point. I mean, of course, President Marcos Jr. visited China earlier this year in January, and, and the reading of a lot of people, including myself, is that m not much came out of that meeting in terms of concessions on the West Philippine Sea issue. And even on the infrastructure front, I'm not sure we got an optimal kind of outcome there. Mm -hmm. Did that perhaps also contribute to President Marcos Jr.'s more openness to double down on our traditional alliances? I, I, well, you know, I think President Marcos... Uh, he knows very well that uh, the relationship with China is one that we have to work on right. and that uh, uh, promises of, of, uh, of, of whatever it is that he was able to sign up in China is something that has to come into, uh, come into play first. Uh, but, you know, I think he's been very clear from day one. Mm -hmm. There is no uh, waffling on his part. Uh, he said it from his State of the Nation, his first State of the Nation, that he will not give up one inch of our territory. And, and rightly so. This is really what it is. I mean, you know, in, 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 in any situation, right. why, why are you going to allow a country or anyone for that matter to take a portion of what is... It is a, it's in our constitution. It is also his, uh, his duty to do so. And, and he knows that very well. Mm -hmm. And so that is a, a, a non-issue, something that... Uh, but he wanted to approach it in such a way that if there's any issue surrounding that, let's talk about it in a, in a manner that we can be clear on what our positions are. But at the same time, obviously, if you are prepared to uh, have a very strong economic uh, activity between our two countries, which is what we're doing here in the United States now, mm -hmm. and that's his instructions to me, is for us to have more economic uh, trade between the, the U.S. and the Philippines. That is the approach mm -hmm. that we have to have, approach for both our countries. And uh, as I said, these uh, EDCA sites are part and parcel of what we had agreed on uh, uh, more than a decade ago during the but time what of about President the four Tony additional? Is simply implementing. But what about but the four additional ones? Yeah, uh, Ambassador Server. I mean, what about the four additional ones? Because you have no less than... I mean, uh, I mean, Marcos, Senator, I mean, Marcos, said the Foreign Affairs Committee, former President Duterte, kind of, you know, raising concerns, perhaps this could be a little bit provocative. This could put us in a bind when it comes to the Taiwan crisis. So what you're suggesting here is that because President Marcos Jr. has a better understanding of what's happening on the ground because of his access to information, 
is making the right decision accordingly that perhaps is not being appreciated by people outside the government? Is, is, is that what's going on here? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, again, you know, it, it is it's a decision that is being made by the head of state. And we have to respect that because he has the information mm -hmm. that uh, he thinks is best for our country. And he, he has said it on many occasions. I think that uh, the Taiwan issue, for instance, is something that we cannot avoid. It, it's, it's, mm -hmm. We can see it. He can see it from, from Ilocos Norte yeah, on a yeah, clear day. Yeah. He can actually see Taiwan. Mm. And you, know, you, you, you cannot avoid it. Uh, it's the proximity of, 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 of where we are uh, in, in the... Um, in, in our geography is that we're right in the center of all of these things. And he sees that having this additional EDCA sites uh, will give us, it is a deterrence. This is what we've always said. Right. All of these moves that we're making is, right. is, is a contributing to a deterrent way of finding ways and means to a peaceful solution rather than a conflict. Mm -hmm. I think that the opinion expressed by many others, including uh, Senator Jaime, is, is an opinion that they have, which we, we all respect. But uh, at some point in time, when you see that it is it is best for our country, perhaps you will change, or they will change their minds, like what happened to the uh, Cagayan uh, governor. I think that he was uh, properly briefed that uh, this is going to be good for his province mm -hmm. in, in the end, uh, which will deter any kind of uh, situation uh, that we all want to avoid. Uh, I mean, of course, Ambassador, it's not only the ETCA sites. We're also looking at the biggest Balikatan exercises ever, from my understanding. Even bigger than, I predicted, around 16,000. Apparently, it's 17,000 troops attending, uh, you know, advanced Patriot missile systems, right? The U.S. is going to come in. Uh, a lot is happening as far as bilateral lands. Of course, also the first two plus two in, in seven years. There are also discussions about trilaterals, uh, Philippines, Japan, United States. What's going on here? Is, is the Philippines choosing already between U.S. and China, or, or are, are we still hedging while leaning more on our traditional alliances? I'm asking this, Ambassador, because I have, we have friends in ASEAN who are wondering, like, where is the Philippines going? Because a lot are getting confused, like, uh, and, and, you know, I, 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 I almost hear some people mumbling that is the Philippines becoming the new deputy sheriff of U.S. in ASEAN or Southeast Asia? What's going on there, <laughs> Ambassador? What do you say to these kind of uh, impressions? Yeah. I think those are silly, uh, silly uh, <laughs> uh, observations. Uh, you know, we've had a relationship with the United States for so many years, for so many decades. We we have a, in place the 1951 Mutual Defense Treaty, mm -hmm. which which we signed uh, a long time ago, and um, clearly our relationship is, is very strong. Uh, our armed forces, in fact, the manual of the armed forces is mm -hmm. actually patterned after the United States. If right. we are going to try to change everything, let's say at some point we decide we want to change the whole way we the way we we run our armed forces, it will take years, if not decades, to be able to mm. retrain, and the interoperability yeah, is the reset, going to be yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> you cannot imagine. I I don't think it's it's it's, it's, it's to our amazing. interest. Yeah, yeah. Our armed forces today is probably better equipped and more trained better than we ever. And we're going to get to that point. Mm -hmm. All of those that think that the Philippines is not moving forward in, in terms of modernizing yeah. our armed forces, uh, better just uh, be quiet first because <laughs> uh, from where I sit, I right. can tell you that in, 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 in about five years at the most, our armed forces is going to be at par with other countries in our area. Right. And, and because I see it, mm -hmm. I see it that that's where we're going. The training that we're getting from the Visiting Forces Agreement, our, many of our, uh, our uh, officers that come here to Washington, D.C. And, and to other parts of the United States for training and for, for, interchange, uh, for an exchange uh, program that we have, all that is going to contribute to upgrading our armed forces into a level that we want it to be. We are working at it, and it will. We will get to that point, and I can tell you uh, that uh, all of you who are having uh, uh, what you call doubts, this uh, a negative view right, or right. doubts of where we are going, uh, you will be completely Surprise. wrong <laughs> in, in due time because our armed forces is going to be an armed force that to be con 
to, that you have to contend with. So, that, you know, the old saying that uh, that our Air Force is all air and no force. Right. Where you're going to be wrong soon. We're <laughs> going to have an Air Force with a strong force. Uh, <laughs> Ambassador, speaking of that, so my understanding is you're, you're saying that the whole ETCA maneuver is about deterrence and also expediting the modernization of the Philippines. Is that, uh, is that how you, know, you understand it? That this is, you know, course, this is fundamentally about visit, strengthening deterrence and also our own capabilities. Not being more dependent on the United States because that's yes. what the critics are saying, right? Mm. You know, the policy of the United States is very simple. They, they do not want to have to send their soldiers every time there's a conflict. I mean, that, 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 that I think is very clear. They want to train our soldiers so that when the time comes, we can defend around. ourselves. The United States will be there as our, uh, as our ally, so with other countries. And that's why we have all of these agreements that we're, we're going about with, 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 our, with those like-minded countries like Japan, Australia, and, and in fact, even our ASEAN uh, friends like Indonesia and even Vietnam to that, for that matter. We all, want, we all want the same thing. We want our sovereign state to be the way it is mm -hmm. and to protect the, the, the ASEAN region and the Indo-Pacific in general. All, all that obviously is part and parcel of what our objective is when we have disagreements. What to look forward to in the coming years when it comes to bilateral trade and investment relations with the United States? Well, we we're, we're getting many of our economic managers, obviously, are going to be here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we've already started that when President Marcos went to New York. We, uh, President Marcos spent uh, a lot of time with mm -hmm. American uh, potential investors, and he listened to them. He, he did not... Uh, go to New York and just simply went there to the United Nations and that's it. Right. He actually worked every single day from 8 o'clock up to 6 o'clock in the evening. It was all meetings with potential investors. And we got a lot of feedback from them and what we needed to do to make our economy uh, more conducive to their investments. Uh, and, 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 and it's already coming into play. This takes a lot of work, of mm -hmm. course. You know, these things don't happen overnight. You just don't click the finger and, and they're there. Right. But so, but one of the things that we need to really do is to open up our, our economy, and I think that that mm -hmm. is where uh, the legislative branch of our uh, of our government, uh, right. headed by uh, Speaker Martin and also uh, Senate President Miggs, uh, will be able to better understand wh right. how we can open up our economy. So we, we because remember we are competing. Uh, with our ASEAN friends. Vietnam is number one in right. the list of who we're competing with. But they have an authoritarian government. You know, they don't need legislation. All it takes is probably one one signature of their head of state and uh, and, and it's a go. Uh, or they can change everything accordingly to, to, to be able to suit the investor. In our case, we have to make all these moves. And hopefully, we will be able to move faster because we have both our legislative and our executive branch in the same uh, in the same wavelength, so to speak, mm -hmm. and in sync, and to be able to speed it up a little more. That's what we're working on right now. And and again, mm -hmm. I'm confident that uh, uh, the wave of the future is that we're going to get more of this type of uh, trade uh, coming from both our countries. Now, the free trade agreement is a little bit uh, challenging yeah. because the United States right now is not into. Uh, too much into that. They yeah. have the Indo-Pacific or the Indo-Pacific uh, economic framework. Economic framework that, but still, it's still very unclear. Mm. Now, what the strategy that we're going to adopt really in the future is that right. we're going to go by state. Mm. Uh, each state, right. uh, federal government like the United States, we will go to each state where we think there are potential American businesses. Right. We have to explain to that particular state, the governor and their legislature that uh, it is beneficial for both our countries to have mm. such an agreement of some sort. Uh, that is the challenge that we will have in, uh, and that's what we're going to work on in the next couple of years. Uh, but we're also working on the uh, general systems preference, which is GSP, right. which is also very important. I think the United States is very open to that right now. In fact, I have several meetings with many uh, U.S. congressmen and senators involved in the uh, in the trade uh, international trade that will again uh, give us an opportunity to have the GSP renewed
on that note, thank you very much, Ambassador. Just as I expected, one hour is not enough. There's so much to discuss. Thank you very much for your generosity and well, for sharing us your point of view. Always a pleasure, Ambassador Jose Manuel Romaldes, Philippine Ambassador to the United States. Well, thank you very much again, Richard. It's always great to have this conversation with you. And uh, you know that my doors are all, always open to <laughs> people like you. Uh, it, it's, it's a nice, good intellectual conversation I have with you all the time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Catch us again next Monday, 9.30 p.m. on One News. You can also check out the long conversation on Spotify because this is long. It's almost like a podcast. Once again, I'm Richard Haydarian, and that is The View from Manila.